Kia ora tato and good evening. Thank you for tuning in to tonight's webinar. Uh, my name is Sarah Collins. I'm the Education and Outreach Manager at Sir Peter Blake Marine Education and Recreation Center, where I lead the coordination of Sea Week. Thank you all for being here tonight for our last webinar of 2024. This evening's webinar will provide an insight into how intertwining Indigenous knowledge and values with modern marine management practices can achieve positive outcomes. We're going to open up a quick poll while I provide some background info and then launch intro into introductions. So um, participants, you should all see a poll pop up, which you can um, just, you've got a couple questions and I'll tell you about Sea Week. So Kopapa Moana is New Zealand's annual celebration of the sea. It, sea Week's mission is to excite and inspire everyone to renew their connections with the sea. Our pinnacle of events occurs annually at the beginning of March and features a variety of ocean inspired activities throughout the country. Okay, and um, where I work at Sir Peter Blake Merck, we have, uh, we organize activities year round to create opportunities for everyone to learn something new about our ocean, gain insight into different perspectives and ask questions. Um, so, before we begin, um, I'm gonna intro my speakers. Um, this event series, oops. this event series has been, um, the Nakororo event series combines in-person and online engagements and has been made possible thanks to support from the New Zealand National Commission for UNESCO. Throughout the series, we've been exploring different topics to emphasize the diverse connections and interactions we all have with the sea since our daily lives are intertwined with the health of the marine environment. Tonight, we'll be exploring how marine stewardship can encompass both traditional knowledge and Western science to meet the needs of various communities. There are years of experience in marine conservation, advocacy, and environmental policy in tonight's lineup. Joining me virtually, we have four guest speakers who work with communities, stakeholders, and policymakers to safeguard marine habitats and preserve cultural connections to Taimwana. To start us, off, to start us off, I'm going to open with a karakia, and then we're going to dive in and I will introduce our speakers. Thank you for, um, I'm going to end the poll. Thank you so much for, um, for giving us some insight to where you're tuning in from. So, um, kitai. <laughs> I ki ake ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hohu, ti he moriora. Cease the winds from the west, cease the winds from the south. Let the breeze blow over the land, let the breeze blow over the sea. Let the red tipped dawn come with a sharpened air, a touch of frost, a promise of a glorious day. And with that, I will um, introduce you our lineup and uh, give you a brief overview of what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, we're going to be exploring traditional views of, the, of our relationship to the ocean and look at our role in protecting it a bit more broadly, an oceanic vision. And then we'll hear about firsthand experiences setting up marine protected areas in the Otago, East Taipuri, and the Cook Islands. Our first guest speaker will be Dr. Daniel Higaroa, Associate Professor at University of Auckland to Waipapa Tamte Ro. Um, and UNESCO New Zealand Commissioner for Culture, and much more. He's an established world expert on weaving indigenous knowledge and science to realize the dreams and aspirations of the community he works with. And then we'll have tonight's second presentation, which will be by James Tremlett. He works at the interface of environmental policy, law, and social science. Our third presentation will be by Dr. Anne-Marie Jackson, who's a co-director and uh, National Science and National Center of Research Excellence Coastal People Southern Skies and is Kai Hotu, Managing Director of Rehutai Consulting. Our final speaker will be conservationist Jacqueline Evans, and she'll be sharing insight into her work with the community and stakeholders in the Cook Islands to establish Marae Moana Sacred Ocean, a multiple use ocean protected area in 20, established in 2017. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to send us your questions at any time. We'll take one question after each presentation and any other questions at the end. To start, we will hear from Dan Hikaroa, Associate Professor at University of Auckland, Waipapa Tamatoro, 
without further ado, let me hand things over to Dan. Well, kia ora, Sarah. O te rā koutou katoa e whakarongo mai nei. Uh, ngā mihi o te ahi ahi pō ki a koutou katoa. First, I just want you to close your eyes, actually, and take in one deep breath. And then another one. And out. That both centres us, but also shows us the significance of the ocean. One of those breaths came from the forests, and one of those breaths is thanks to our phytoplankton and the organisms in the ocean. So a healthy ocean is something that we absolutely fundamentally rely on. I'm just going to try and share screen now. It worked beautifully before. Let's hope it does it again. Here we go. So in my presentation, I'll think about framing things slightly differently and maybe thinking like a fish, an ocean-centric vision. And in a forward to a recent book on climate change in the Pacific, His Highness Tuiatua Tupua Tamasese Taisi Efi, former head of the state of Samoa, urged his readers to adopt a perspective based on va tapuia, sacred relationships between the cosmos, ancestors, humans and animals. He suggested that we might think about climate change from the vantage point of other life forms, perhaps a dog, the ocean, the stars, trees, a bird or a fish and explore Pacific worlds patterned by existential interconnections between people and other beings. Likewise, a generation ago, the Tongan scholar Epili Hauofa conjured up a vision centred upon the Pacific, or as we know it, Te Moana Nui Akiwa, the largest geographical feature on the planet. And his words, Oceania is vast, Oceania is expanding, is hospitable and generous. Humanity rising from the depths of the brine and regions of fire deeper still. Oceania is us. We are the sea. We are the ocean. Hawafa noted that most Western views of this great sea are based on a terrestrial vision. And he states, continental men, namely Europeans, on entering the Pacific after crossing huge expanses of ocean, introduced the idea of islands in a far sea. From this perspective, the islands are tiny, isolated dots in a vast ocean. Later on, their kinsmen drew imaginary lines across the sea, marking the colonial boundaries that confined ocean people to tiny spaces for the first time. This was a manifestation of the order of things paradigm, coined by Michel Foucault, that formed the foundation stone upon which the Enlightenment was established, and from which the contemporary practice of command and control by governments and engineers, and in some instances scientists, has its origins. This imperial view of the Pacific Ocean, the peaceful ocean, with its gridded control of space-time, also divided the Earth's seas, one from another. In fact, our planet is ruled by one great interflying ocean, with its circulating winds and currents regulating temperature and climate, migratory fish and surging tidal rhythms. As the United Nations Second World Ocean Assessment notes, this great sea covers more than 70% of the surface of the planet and forms 95% of the biosphere. Rather than Earth, our planet might be more accurately called sea, a shift away from terrestrial framings and anthropocentric visions. In world history, the ancestors of Pacific Islanders were the first to invent blue water sailing on Mokahodua, double-hulled ocean-going canoes. They crossed the wide ocean following winds, currents, migrating whales, land roosting birds, the sun, and star paths. Successions of stars that rise above the horizon at night, marking the bearings of particular destination islands. Sailing was at the heart of their cosmological visions. According to, according to Tahitian chants, at the beginning of the world, star ancestors sailed across the sky in their canoes, fishing up new stars and constellations. Star pillars were placed above voyaging marae, ceremonial centres on particular islands. As island navigators sailed through the night, Watching the stars in the sky mirrored in the ocean below, they were retracing the sky voyages of their star ancestors. The first European explorers who followed the star navigators into the Pacific saw the sea differently. They had been sent in a race to claim new lands for their monarchs. Using instrumental observation, they measured and gridded the world, tracing coastlines and producing logs and charts as proof of their discoveries. While they were also people of the sea, watching the sun and the moon and weathering storms, their mission was one of mastery, not just of the Pacific itself, but of islands and their peoples. 
since colonial times, a struggle between thinking like a master in which the sea and its inhabitants are understood as resources for human use and thinking like a fish. One oceanic life form among many has been ongoing in the Pacific and around the planet. Recently, I was in Barcelona at the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for, uh, for scientific development, sustainable development, sorry, and assisted in the writing and launch of Tawara Te Aramafiti, a UNESCO paper charting the revival of traditional navigation knowledge in and from Aotearoa, drawing from the knowledge and experience of master navigator Jack Thatcher. And I'm quite cognizant that even though I speak about that stuff, James, who will come up next, has actually been doing that stuff. The question then arises as to whether humanity can effectively deal with devastating um, planetary changes with strategies that assume the world was created for human uses and that people can command nature to do their bidding. When a recent virtual gathering of Nobel Prize winners addressed these dilemmas, the language was vivid and bleak. According to Sandra Diaz, an Argentinian ecologist, we have incontestable evidence that the living fabric of the earth has been unraveled fast. The only reason this is happening is the present dominant model of appropriating nature. Runaway climate change, massive biodiversity loss, and intolerable social and environmental inequality among people are simply the, the most serious symptoms of the same root problem. They must be tackled together. Oceanic philosophies that presuppose the fundamental interconnection of all living beings and planetary systems might help us to imagine different ways forward for people and the planet. As Tuiatua Tamasese Taisi Efi has suggested, thinking about current existential challenges from the vantage point of a fish or a bird or a forest, or indeed uh, the ocean, might provide alternatives to extractive anthropocentric perspectives. Novel governance experiments of this kind have been happening in Aotearoa, New Zealand, namely the Tu Uruweta Act of 2014 and the Te Awa Tupua Act of 2017, and are transforming public, government and scientific understandings of rivers and mountains as being. Within those acts, a forest and a river are afforded legal personhood. Te Uriwera is ancient and enduring, a fortress of nature, alive with history. Its scenery is abundant with mystery, adventure and remote beauty. Te Uriwera is a place of spiritual value, with its own mana, and Modi. Te Uriwera has an identity in and of itself, inspiring people to commit to its care. Te Awatupua is an indivisible and living whole, comprising the Whanganui River from the mountains to the sea, incorporating all its physical and metaphysical elements. Te Awatupua is a spiritual and physical entity that supports and sustains both the life and natural resources within the Whanganui River and the health and well-being of the iwi hapu and other communities of the river. That language may sound like poetry, and it certainly is poetic, but it's also the law in our country. These words are directly from those respective Acts of Parliament. These initiatives driven by Māori have created spaces for thinking about rivers, forests, mountains, valuing them as holistic, historical and cultural entities with lives and rights of their own. These build upon relational understandings of rivers, forests and mountains as entities that are more ancient and powerful than people, viewing rivers as the lifeblood and forests as the lungs of society and the land. Within those relational ways of knowing and being, mountains and rivers can simultaneously be ancient kin, revered elders and living entities. As Māori perspectives conceptualise humans as part of the living systems within innate relationships between people and rivers, land, forests and seas, they offer prospect to reframe natural resource governance, ownership and management. This kind of thinking has also been extended to Hine Moana, the personification of the ocean. In 2019, during the 250th commemoration of the arrival of the endeavour to an Aotearoa, bringing the first Europeans ashore, Moana Nui Te Pai Pai o Tangaroa Symposium was held, and I wear the t-shirt from that attended by the Pacific Star Navigators and other oceanic experts on fisheries in the sea. Here, new voyaging histories were shared and ancient ways of knowing and being resurfaced. These navigators embraced the science and sciences and technologies as enriching their own kin-based vision of the ocean, and they often carry out scientific experiments on their voyages. Thus, the legacies of Enlightenment science brought to the Pacific on board the endeavour are interwoven with Māori visions of the sea as a great marae, 
in which the sea itself, the winds, the stars and whales are all ancestors. And, and as kin, people can think like fish. The ocean is vast and deep and seemingly impenetrable. It has never been conquered by human beings. With its infinity of life forms, it holds many secrets. With a shift away from rest and hubris and human exceptionalism, the law of the sea could be rewritten to recognise an oceanic vision, one in which the world's great ocean has its own independent life and its own right to be healthy and flourish. From there is but a short step to recognise in the independent life and rights of the planet and to putting humanity in its proper place as one planetary life form among many. And as I close with my final slide, I just want to share with you um, He Whakaputanga Moana, an initiative brought together by Indigenous leaders operating outside of government structures where they said we need to get personhood for whales because by doing that, it will actually protect all of the oceans. And this is from one of their spokespeople, Nita Simmons. At the very forefront of this cloak of protection is the primary principle that this protection is this part of the world and this part of the world has to come from the indigenous people of the various countries of the Pacific. It can't be a Western government-led initiative. Nō reira, kia katoa, let's think like a fish. Amazing. It's so important for us to look at our relationship from a different perspective. So thank you for sharing with us this concept of thinking like a fish. Thank you. Um, we're going to just segue straight up into um, a, a presentation by James Tremel. James is interested in how policy, law, and social science could interact to re-engage our communities with our relationships with the ocean. He's currently working with the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environment Program and the Pacific Islands Roundtable for Nature Conservation, leading the development of a new Pacific framework for nature conservation. James is a surfer and proud crew member of the Waka Horua Nahira Kai Mai Sapati. Sorry, I'm going to hand that one over to you, James. Yoda Tato, thanks very much, Sarah. Um, thank you for the introduction and for having us all here. We really appreciate the opportunity. And thank you, Dan, for opening us in such a fantastic way as well. I'm just going to share my screen quickly. I'm hoping you can see the, the presentation mode now. Awesome. Yeah, so as Sarah mentioned, my name is James Tremlett. Um, I normally start with a picture like this. This is where the piece of ocean that I'm from. This is Waipaparoa on the, the eastern verges of Tamaki Makoto. Um, I'm a Pākehā. I grew up here. And this is the, the piece of ocean that I, that I um, mostly recall my links back to when we think of ocean in Aotearoa. As... Um, as Dan and, and Sarah also both alluded to, I also want to acknowledge our beautiful Waka Haurua Ngahiraka Maitafiti. I've had the real privilege of being a crew member on Ngahiraka for, well, since 2015 under Master Navigator Jack Thatcher, who Dan also talked about as well. And really this experience shapes the way that I think about our moana and our relationship with it. So acknowledgements to Ngahiraka and everyone that's involved with her as well. As a funny coincidence, I also started with a quote from Epeli Hawafa um, and just wanted to read this out as well um, from a different text, The Ocean and Us. And in this, uh, Papa Epeli is talking about um, UNCLOS, the Law of the Sea Convention. I mostly uh, work in the fields these days of, of policy and governance regarding the ocean, and I want to talk a little bit about that and the relationship to, um, to Indigenous rights and traditional knowledge in the Pacific. So this quote, it is one of the great ironies of the law of the sea convention, which enlarged our national boundaries, that it is also extending the territorial instinct to where there was none before. Because of the resource potentials of the op open sea and the ocean bed, the water that had united subregions of Oceania may, in the past may become a major divisive factor in the relationships between our countries in the future. It is therefore essential that we ground any new regional identity in a belief in the common heritage of the sea. A realization of the fact that the ocean is uncont uncontainable and pays no respect to territoriality should spur us to advance the notion based on physical reality and practices that date back to the initial settlements of Oceania 
that the sea must remain open to all of us. And by all of us, he's meaning all Pacific peoples um, in Oceania. So I, as I mentioned, I mostly work in um, at a regional level uh, for with the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environment Program, SPRIP, um, and the Pacific Islands Roundtable for Nature Conservation on regional policies that try to tie together um, how we look after the ocean um, across the Pacific. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about those uh, for the next couple of minutes, in part um, because it's quite a distinction from some of the ways that we talk about um, the ocean um, through the ways that Dan talked about and some of those other, um, those other perhaps older ways that we're trying to reinforce as well. So in terms of uh, current developments in ocean governance and policy around the Pacific, there's a couple of things that have happened over the last few years that really shape how countries cooperate for sharing these big ocean spaces um, between each other. So most obviously we have this new Global Ocean Treaty or BB&J Agreement. BB&J is biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. That basically means the high seas, the areas outside of the exclusive economic zones and all the living stuff in the high seas is what the Global Ocean Treaty applies to. So that was adopted in 2023 and mostly due to the really incredible efforts of Pacific negotiators at those international negotiations, the treaty can contains groundbreaking acknowledgements of traditional knowledge in the high seas, uh, which has wider implications for international environmental law. So essentially those provisions about traditional knowledge in the, in the areas beyond the exclusive economic zone can in some sense be seen to apply to all, um, all international law regarding the ocean. Um, the treaty does need 60 ratifications to come into force. Currently, there's only 14 and a couple of Pacific nations as well. Um, but we're really pushing for that to be ratified as soon as we can so that we can get on with implementation. There's a whole suite of regional policies um, that relate to the ocean, in particular, the Pacific Framework for Nature Conservation, which I'm involved in a project to renew at the moment. And there's opportunities to, to be part of that process that I'll talk about in just a second the framework for a Pacific oceanscape um, and the Pacific regional culture strategy, among others. And then there's national level ocean policies that a number um, of our uh, Pacific whānau have, have been really uh, proactive and, and world leading really in, in establishing uh, for their own countries. Um, so we've got here, um, and apologies if I've missed anyone, but, but just preparing this slide before, um, the Cook Islands, Fiji, Papua New Guinea, Marshall Islands, Samoa, Solomon Islands, and Vanuatu at least have established national ocean, ocean policies. And certainly that's something that we could learn from here in Aotearoa. But throughout all of this, there's a strong focus on traditional knowledge and indigenous rights in the context of ocean, um, of ocean change and climate change, including sea level rise. And in particular, there's a uh, there's a regional effort to safeguard traditional knowledge that is related to particular parts of, of islands or coastline that is at risk from sea level rise. And of course, that traditional knowledge is not just related to that particular verge of coastline, but can um, contain elements that stretch far out into the deep ocean through knowledge of migratory species such as seabirds or whales, um, or through voyaging practices such as we've been talking about already. I mentioned this framework for nature conservation. Um, so just really quickly, this framework is our, our regional Pacific strategy uh, for biodiversity. It's, it's endorsed by all the Pacific Island governments, as well as the 18 member organizations of PERT, the Roundtable for Nature Conservation. That's really the umbrella organizations for the big regional entities that do biodiversity work in the Pacific. So the framework is recognized under the CBD um, as our regional biodiversity strategy, and it's designed to sit between our new global biodiversity framework and our national level policies about how we look after biodiversity in our own places. And of course, that includes uh, the ocean. And when we talk about the Pacific, we're mostly talking about the ocean, of course. It contains, really importantly, the set of eight principles which establish Indigenous community rights as the, um, the preeminent preeminent principle for implementing biodiversity work in the Pacific. So that these principles were established about 30 years ago, um, and they've been iteratively developed over those decades um, by the Pacific and then reinforced by Pacific governance um, at, at these five yearly nature, 
nature conferences um, at which the next framework is going to be adopted. Um, so this is a really, it's a strong ethical framework for undertaking biodiversity work in the Pacific, um, and it continues getting stronger with each iteration. And so that, uh, that reinforces the way in which these plans um, and these really high level um, global initiatives, which sometimes are designed without much regard um, to the way things are done in the Pacific, how they should be implemented um, in the Pacific region. And so in, in my current work, one of the things that we're doing is, um, is reviewing the current framework and we're starting the process of drafting a new framework for the next five years. And we're reaching out to the, the wider community of people ar across the Pacific who are interested in how we look after our ocean and, and our terrestrial ecosystems as well um, to help shape the direction of um, regional collaborative biodiversity policy and action. Um, there's an opportunity co to contribute at the moment. The easiest way to do that is to go to our, our um, PacificIslandsRoundtable.com is, is the, the website for PERT. Um, and to join the mailing list and in the, around about the middle of next week, I'll be circulating the first opportunity to contribute to the co-drafting process for our new regional framework, um, which will be formally adopted at the Pacific Nature Conference in 2026. So please do get involved if, the, if this policy stuff is something that you're at all interested in. We need as many voices at po as possible to reinforce the strength of these kinds of mechanisms. But of course, that's that's just one way of looking at things. And I think it's really important the, the perspective that Dan brought first in terms of questioning some of the ways that these relationships with the ocean are framed through main, mainstream uh, policy uh, framings. Um, and in particular, this is a, a dialogue that's, that we've been having since that seminar in 2019 um, that Dan alluded to as well. And thinking about new ways forward for the ocean. And for myself, I, I feel that um, if we're looking at a governance level, um, these way forwards, ways forward start by asking the right questions. Um, and there might be questions that are unusual perhaps for some of us um, who come from a, a more Western sense of thinking about the ocean or relating about the ocean, which perhaps is um, a, a different sense to a Pacific one. So asking the right questions such as, who is the ocean? We often think about the ocean, especially as scientists, as a what? Um, or a, an it rather than a who. Um, and what does the answer to that first question mean for our relationships with the ocean and how we conceive of the ocean as an entity? So in Aotearoa, we may talk about the ocean having mana and Modi. We may talk about the voice of the ocean, which raises questions about uh, who is best placed to listen to that voice and interpret that voice for the rest of us. We might talk about the agency of the ocean as an entity um, in and of herself, himself, um, and we may, may sometimes talk about rights, which I, I find a, a difficult conception because um, in a way that's an artificial way of thinking as well um, and a, an imported way of thinking, but it can be useful as well to think about what are the rights of the ocean? Um, does the ocean indeed have a right to exist and thrive in and of itself? And if so, how do we articulate that within our systems of policy and governance? Um, and so perhaps some starting points as an offering um, for this context. Um, perhaps it means starting with these notions of reciprocity and obligation, which have always tied um, indigenous communities to their, uh, to their particular parts of, of the ocean that they descend from. And of course, respect for the rights of the communities who whakapapa to whatever part of the ocean that we happen to be talking about. Um, and if we think back to our voyaging communities, those, those practices uh, that are embodied in those navigators uh, in those voyages that still maintain the practices of sailing to, from place to place in a traditional manner. Those are things that can only be maintained uh, by respecting the rights uh, to, to pass down that knowledge and by sometimes even resourcing um, the ability to pass down that knowledge as well, because it's a, it's a tough thing to do um, and it's, it's a difficult thing to always pass down in the way it's meant to be passed down. So I think, I think I'll leave it there. Thanks, Sarah, um, and pass on to whoever's next. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, hey, James, um, that was fabulous. And there's that just shows us so much the, how much there is for us to learn from all the work that's happening in other parts of the Pacific. And I really love your your last slide, your ways forward for the ocean questions. 
um, which I think we're going to circle back to the question that's just popped up in the q and I'll, I'll give James a chance to look at that. And um, Dan's got some insight to share as well, but we'll save that for a little bit later. We'll, we'll move on to our next presenter, uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Jackson, co-director of the National Center of Research Excellence, Coastal People, Southern Skies. And she utilizes her expertise in Kaupapa Māori research to work alongside coastal communities to advance goals of Kaitiaki Tangan. Thanks so much for joining us, Anne-Marie. I'll hand it over to you now. Kia ora tātou. Tēnā koe, Sarah, me tō korero. Kia, whaka, kia, ka tūwhita tō tātou, hui hei te, o te pō nei. O te rā, kia, kia kōroa, kua kōrero te e mua i ahau. Tēnā koe, Dan Pai, ki te kite i ahau i runga i tēnei karanga kaupapa tātou. Kia ora, everybody. Wonderful to be here. Thank you. An acknowledgement, Sarah, for opening our kōrero tonight, too, and acknowledgement to the other two speakers and to my good friend and colleague, Dan. Kia ora. Uh, ko ai au, ko pokopoko te tani whā, ko rangi riri, te rākau whakangau tai, ko hoero te ngaru, ko māhuhu te waka, ko rongo mai te ariki, ko ngāti whātua te iwi, ko kaipara te moana he nō te moana o kaipara ahau, nō reira kaipara moana, kaipara uri. Kei o te poti ahau e noho ana i raro i te maru o kaitau whānau, whānui, ko e Mary Jackson tō koingoa. Kia ora everybody, my name is Anne Marie. And as I said in my pipiha, or my cultural tr tradition of how I introduce myself, I'm from a number of the different tribes of the North. And for tonight, uh, my I'd like to share my particular affiliations to the Kaipara Moana in the North of Auckland uh, too, where I sort of decided after listening to the two previous speakers that I might change tact a little bit uh, from what I had prepared today and, and, and recognising the time and the evening that we're in, I thought I'd just share a couple of stories, uh, really. So it's quite interesting for me as I reflect back on my career and the work that I've done. How is it that I've come to be a scholar, an academic, a researcher, working within the space broadly in kaitiaki tanga, physical and spiritual guardianship, which has a very strong tangaroa, hine moana, moana, ocean context. And really, if I think about in that pipiha, that tribal identity marker that I just described, and some of my ancestors who first arrived in a very strong waka thing coming through tonight, which is wonderful. So some of my ancestors, as they traverse from Hawaii to Aotearoa, it was actually over a, a disagreement between two brothers. Um, they, was, they were warring uh, at, at that time, and they um, intentionally decided that they we're going to part ways and to, to set foot on a, on a new adventure. And as they set out on that new adventure, they traversed through and, and um, dropped some different whānau off along the way. This is obviously cutting the story quite, the story quite short. Um, and that helps to contextualise us within to, into the Pacific and, and those broader whakapapa connections, genealogical links that we have. Now, as our ancestors uh, come further towards Aotearoa, uh, it was actually our, our, the captain of our canoe, Rungumai, at the time, one of the brothers who set foot in, uh, as they arrived, did the various things that they did at the time, populating a new place. Uh, our, our canoe actually capsized um, in the Kaipura Moana or at a place called Tāporopora, which is where a place of one of our ancient wānang or ancient schools of learning. And it was at that place uh, that he, the canoe, Mahuhu Kitarangi, capsized and he was actually, he drowned uh, and, and died uh, at, at that place. And so it's probably no surprise really that in my own genealogy that I have this long-standing historical notion of the importance uh, and the power of the ocean and that very close relationship that we have. And then if I fast forward a few generations, it's probably not really that surprising uh, to me either, or picking up back from that story, he was actually eaten by a fish. And so there's certain traditions of fish that we don't eat as a tribe um, as well. So that's probably my first point to come to. Come to we think about ocean stewardship or, as I frame, kaitiakitanga here is the importance of traditional knowledge. 
And so if you come to the north and you say serve or you're hosting people from the north, for example, and you serve the particular fish uh, to us, you know, that could be quite culturally offensive for some. And so the importance of understanding those cultural traditions and knowledge and learning are, are one aspect that we can offer as Indigenous peoples in our understanding of long-term change too that occurs and the importance of our cultural practice and traditions uh, is one thing to pick up on. And then if I fast forward a few generations uh, to, um, to the kind of early contact period uh, in Aotearoa, and I think about some of the strong traditions in, in my family and, and also in the work that I do today, certainly pertinent as I heard um, James speak as well about some of, and Dan, some of the Tesiriti or Waitangi context that we're in, in Aotearoa. You know, there's some pretty important bills that are going, being pushed through governments at the moment. Now, if I think about in my own family, like some on the call potentially on the webinar tonight, uh, I'm a direct descendant of signatories to Tesiriti and to the prior text, He Whakaputanga, as well. And so, as a direct descendant of those te tiriti and the phrase that I'll use and draw on uh, and then link it back to Kaitiakitanga in particular is this notion of tinoranga tiritanga. The tinoranga tiritanga is the ultimate power and authority that's derived from mana and mana being your spiritual and physical authority. And so in signing tinoranga tiritanga, that, that is what our chiefs at the time were advocating for a tino ranga tiritanga for the collective of which an aspect included fisheries, of course. And so by fast forward, fast forward, here I am, an eager-eyed uh, person back in 2007, it would have been now, thinking, oh, I think I might want to do a PhD. What should I do it on? And that comes into the conversation that Sarah asked me to talk about tonight and to touch on is I had a wonderful experience where I was asked to head along to a hui uh, and for those who might know it, uh, the place called Onuku in Akaroa or Onuku near Akaroa and near Christchurch, um, which some whānau may know. Uh, and there a number of, a very large research program was occurring and a number of projects um, were being created in what we would term today as co-creation uh, of research. It was sort of the early for formative days of some of these things we think about today. And I had the great privilege of meeting a number of Naitahu leaders at the time. So for myself, living in the underneath the custodianship of Naitahu, but not being from Naitahu, uh, offers an interesting dynamic. How can you be a good Manuhiri, you're a good guest and support the aspirations of the home people where you're living. Now, one such project emerged, they needed somebody to do work on asking, do Taiapuri, so this particular marine protected area kind of, customary protection area tool, does do Taiapuri allow for tinoranga tiratanga or not? So Taiapuri are these interesting tools that actually were created in the Fisheries Act in, re in response to the Crown's ineffective uh, pursuit, I suppose, or effective, depending on how you look at it, um, in the, uh, um, in the uh, um, treaty obligations. And so people would have heard of the Sea Lord deal and other things. This is Roger Nomex back in the 1980s, coming into the early, early 90s. And so the Fano at Kati Huirapa Ki Pukitaraki in back in 1989, they uh, they put forward, it was very innovative at the time in the context of the serious political mobilization that existed in Aotearoa at the time, probably a time that we're coming back into in Aotearoa at the moment. And they, they applied, so from Kaditani, about 45 kilometers north of Dunedin, one of the principal hapu, they applied for this thing called a taiapuri. And overnight, which I got to study in my PhD, overnight, and some of the language that was utilized, it it's, was termed by the public iwi versus kiwi. 
and that those natives were trying to lock away the access for the marine environment. Now, some of that rhetoric is, of course, very highly prevalent today. And so what I'd like to offer is what I've seen in being able to work alongside the East Otago Taiapuri, very much in the behind the wonderful kaitiaki, those people who implement kaitiaki tanga, this notion of ocean stewardship, is really since time immemorial, but certainly in a formal way through the problematic legislation that works kind of, is that you have this coastal community who live and breathe their marine environment every day, who are able to manage alongside the community. Their setup is 50% iwi, 50% community members on their committee, and they get to manage all of the things that are of importance to their wider community. And so what Kaisiaki Tanga is, is it is the physical expression, or well, some will talk about it as the physical manifestation of Tinoranga Tiritanga. And the people who can implement that Kaitiaki Tanga or that spiritual and physical guardianship, they're the Kaitiaki. So Tiaki comes from the word to guard, conserve, to preserve, look after. And then when you put it into put the kai at the start, it makes it an actor. So the kaitiaki, they become the guardians, the preservers, the, the custodians, etc. And as I said in my pipiha back at the start, is that you can be a, as a kaitiaki, you can take a human form, uh, but norm, quite often, as Dan shared, you'll, they can be non-human forms. So like for me, as I said, poko poko te tarifa, Poko Poko is one of our kaitiaki from the north who looks after the different waterways uh, to, and, and, and many others. And so these ideas of kaitiaki is that as the kaitiaki, if we talk about it in the human form, is that they are the ones who get to uphold and maintain the mana and therefore the tinoranga tiratanga of the thing, the object, the people that they're trying to guard, preserve, or look after. And so, as Dan and James have spoken about, the wonderful thing with Indigenous knowledge, and I think that's why it's really quite very relevant in the Moana context, is, is that we see the world in its whole. And as you know, in the Moana, we, we joke about it quite a lot, you know. A fish doesn't know when it's entered into a different, um, oh, it's now gone into, to draw on, some of Dan's, oh, you've gone into a different area now. It's like you can't manage the moana and its complexities in the individual pieces. But what you can do, and what certainly what Indigenous knowledge provides, is a way of thinking about the moana in its whole. And that certainly has been my experience in working alongside the East Otago Taiapuri for many years. And plus, we have a lot of fun, too. Um, and a lot of debates around how do you manage the various things that you're trying to manage. Now, if I just fast forward slightly again um, and to start to wrap up my quarter all before I hand it, um, hand it over to, to back to Sarah and then on to Jackie, is that one of the things I get to do um, now is after working with Isa Tāgra Taiapuri for over 17 years and looking at these things like Taiapuri, Mā Taitai, Rāhui, my own place in the world and those unique things I bring as an, as an academic, is that I now lead part of a leadership team who get to bring those voices and aspirations of coastal communities with around 140 to 150 other researchers and students in a consortia called Coastal People southern skies and our aspirations are to look at Modi order of coastal communities. Modi is normally the thing that we're trying to, as kaitiaki, is that we're trying to look after it. For anybody who's spent time in the moana, you know when you, whatever it is you're doing and you're in the water, there's something that you can feel and there's a sense that you have there that is greater than what you are. So whether, no matter what your ideological or 
religious stances, for example, there's something that's there. Now, for us as Māori, we would conceptualise that as Modi, that it is the life force of all things animate and inanimate. They have a life force. And so that's what our view is, is trying to understand what does Modi order look like for coastal communities and Modi shifts in states um, too. And we're wanting to always try to shift it from languishing to flourishing. And how do we go about doing that? And that's part of our wonderful work that we have in coastal people. So a large research consortia over eight years with funded from the Tertiary Education Commission and really trying to understand what does Modi order look like for coastal communities? How can we draw upon our indigenous knowledge alongside Western and other conceptualizations of the importance of Modi order of coastal communities? And we utilize the Southern Cross or Tapai Mahutonga as well in terms of our governance and, and management. Um, but you can have Google or we're cpss.org.nz to find out more information um, as well. And just for my final slide and to summarize, really the work that we do in coastal people, but also alongside our communities across the country and across the Mutu, I'm one of one of the Mangai, one of the speakers who get to represent their aspirations in the work that we're trying to do. And across these big questions that we have in Aotearoa and across the Pacific of how can we try to actually think about what Modi order of coastal communities look like. And I believe that indigenous knowledge and our ways of conceptualizing the world are ways of how we can actually solve these big issues that are in front of us. Kia ora tato. Uh, um, Anne-Marie, that was beautiful. Thank you for sharing that quarter and explaining Kaiteki Tanga in that way with the added depth of your years of experience. I've learned so much, um, so much so far tonight. And you'll see from the comments that many people are really appreciating what um, everyone shared with us tonight. So um, kia ora and uh, nami um, we, We've got a couple of good questions that have uh, popped up, but I actually think that we're just gonna hold off until we'll take all the questions at the end. We've got um, a final presentation from Jackie. Um, and Jackie played a leading role in the establishment of Marae Moana, the world's largest MPA. Jackie was recently researching environmental impacts of mining in the Arctic at the Harvard Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs in Massachusetts. Um, she's back in the Cook Islands and has recently started a brand new role as Pacific Partnerships Director for the Wildlife Conservation Society. Congratulations on your new role. Thank you for being here with us tonight. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw your presentation up right now. There we go. Thank you. While you're doing this, um, kia ora everyone uh, from the Cook Islands. So I'm back in the Cook Islands now, I'm very happy to be here, especially after the day that they had in the United States yesterday. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm pretty happy to be home. Um, thank you also to my uh, co-panelists um, for, for sharing the uh, Indigenous, Aotearoa and Pacific perspective. Um, I, I think that, you know, this recalling what Epeli Holfa um, said about uh, the, his concern for establishing boundaries um, is so relevant to today, you know, in terms of how it's driving territorialism um, and how we're not, um, you know, able to uh, to be in one vaka. Um, so thank you for that, James. And uh, also, you know, just these concepts of thinking of Moana as a whole and think like a fish um, and who is the ocean. So th these are really great uh, things to introduce um, right now. Um, for this uh, session tonight. Um, I think it explains why it's important to incorporate cultural perspectives and um, perform genuine consultations, community consultations, really listening to what people uh, want. Um, and I thought that this is a good opportunity to share how we did this when uh, we established Marae Moana, originally called the um, Cook Islands Marine Park. 
uh, because it's really a practitioner sort of presentation and I hope you bear with me um, because I'm going to be going through this in a chronological order. <laughs> But um, hopefully um, it's going to be useful to you. Um, I, I, I think I've had a lot of questions about how this was done. So this might be a good opportunity for, for you to learn about this next. <clears throat> The next slide, thank you. Um, the Cook Islands Marine Park was first proposed by Kevin Edel, who is a Cook Islands rugby league celebrity. Um, the proposal was to establish the marine park over the southern half of the Cook Islands exclusive economic zone. Um, the park was to measure 1.1 million square kilometres, and its purpose was to attract tourism and for conservation. Kevin proposed the marine park to, to the formal body of Paramount Chiefs, the House of Ariki, we call here in the Cook Islands, um, and to the Cook Islands Cabinet and the Ministry of Marine Resources and the National Environment Service. Cabinet approved the proposal under the then Democratic Party-led government, and then after the national elections that year, Kevin proposed the marine park again to the new cabinet for the Cook Islands Party-led government, and they also approved the proposal in principle. So he had two, both sides of parliament supporting this and the traditional leaders. Um, but the um, government agencies, specifically the Ministry of Marine Resources and the National Environment Service had some reservations about it. And I'll go into that a bit later. So um, there was still a challenge next. Uh, the Cook Islands, a Cook Islands Marine Park Steering Committee was formed under the office of the Prime Minister. The committee was designed to steer the development of the policy and legislation for the Marine Park. The committee began by holding public consultations with the three districts on Rarotonga. Um, these were led by the House of Ariki, who, who are, again, our formal body of paramount chiefs. Uh, and they were supported by the government, uh, the Kutunui, who are our formal body of chiefs, and Te Precaria Society, who is our oldest, longest running local environmental NGO um, locally established. They were also supported financially with the um, and with the technical advice of SPREP and Conservation International. Every year we have an annual independence celebration when large numbers of uh, people from the other islands come to Rarotonga. So we held consultations with those islands during this period as well. Uh, and they only had representatives of those islands though, just small groups um, that came for the festival. Uh, but these consultations were supported by uh, the government, the Kutunui, the formal body of chiefs and IUCN who provided some technical input. So we just had someone just turn turn up from IUCN to sort of observe and gave a little bit of advice at the same time. Next. So uh, the following year, we held the first policy framework workshop where members of the steering committee and others who wanted to attend um, discussed the vision, principles and goals of the Marine Park. We also discussed options for international assistance, um, finding a Māori name for the park and setting up a website and a trust. Later that year, Prime Minister Henry Puna announced his intention to establish the Marine Park at the Pacific Islands Leaders Forum meeting in Rarotonga. He said the purpose of the Marine Park was to provide the necessary framework to promote sustainable development by balancing economic growth interests such as tourism, fishing and deep sea mining with the cons conserving core biodiversity and natural assets in the ocean reefs and islands. At the, at the end of that year, we held the first island consultation on the island of Moket. Next. The island consultations continued in 2013. We have 12 inhabited islands in the Cook Islands. It's extremely expensive to travel around the Cook Islands. In fact, it is often cheaper to fly from Rarotonga to the United Kingdom return than it is to fly to our northernmost islands return. So our consultations were funded by Oceans 5. We had to seek funding from more funding from overseas. In the same year, we held competitions to find a Māori name and a logo for the Marine Park. And the finalists for the name competition were given to Cabinet and they selected Marae Moana. 
which was proposed by a high school student um, at Te Reora College here. Marae Moana roughly translates to sacred ocean. A consultation session began with a inspirational video which showed that the marine park was inspired by our culture and the protection of nature for future generations. It also demonstrated the support we had from both sides of parliament and we handed out our brochures in both Māori and English that outlined the science behind marine protection. We also did a questionnaire survey after the consultation meeting asking the community questions about what they thought about the marine park, foreign fishing and deep sea mining. And we made and distributed television advertisements showing community leaders. Since of the Wade Institute and the Living Oceans Foundation, we did uh, reef health assessments on seven of our nine southern islands. Next. In the southern islands and during the national constitution celebration said we should include the northern islands in the marine park. Um, we traveled to the northern islands to consult communities there. All of the Northern Islands were in favour of being included in the Marine Park. A legal analysis was performed to see which legislation was appropriate for the establishment of the park. And the conclusion was that new legislation would need to be drafted. A workshop was held to present the results of that analysis and ask the community uh, to make additional decisions about how they would like the Marine Park to look. A workshop was also held for heads of ministries to sort out the roles of each agency in the Marine Park and gain clarity and agreement on possible zoning scenarios. Next slide. We also attempted to do a cost benefit analysis. Um, and uh, we had insufficient data for this. Um, instead, our consultant uh, developed a statistical framework out, outlining the data sets that need to be collected um, so that a cost-benefit analysis can be done. The results of the, of the questionnaire survey were that 92% of the public supported the marine park concept, so the greatest resistance wasn't amongst local fishers or our communities, it was actually amongst the government agencies, especially the Ministry of Marine Resources. So we had to establish a smaller task force comprising only government agencies that would be tasked with ironing out these differences amongst themselves. Once we had agreement on some policies such as government institutional arrangements, we invited the traditional leaders in Te Pukaria Society back into the task force to ensure that any further decision-making included cultural and environmental considerations. At this point, we held a second policy workshop to report back to stakeholders and ask for input to fill any gaps. Next slide. We used this data to redraft the policy and presented the final draft of the policy uh, at the third and final policy framework workshop, which was attended by all stakeholders that had been involved in the process up to that time. Participants went through the policy word by word and adopted the policy at the end of the workshop. It was then sent to cabinet for approval and gave us the mandate to begin drafting legislation based on the policy. To begin drafting the legislation, we held a legally designating Maraimoana workshop to discuss the pros and cons of zones within Maraimwana that would be closed to fishing and deep sea mining. Various aspects of the proposed legislation were also discussed at this workshop, including the inst institutional arrangements and whether to include marine spatial planning as a management tool. Following this workshop, drafting, drafting instructions for the legislation were circulated amongst stakeholders for comment and that was followed by uh, the circulation of the first draft of the legislation. Next slide. IUCN held a large marine protected areas meeting in Rarotonga um, in February uh, of, this, uh, of 2017. And this helped local stakeholders see what has been done elsewhere, which I thought was really useful. Um, managers of large MPAs from Papahana Mokua Kea in Hawaii, the New Caledonia Natural Park of the Coral Sea, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, 
um, US Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument were all, all in attendance to share information about their large uh, marine protected areas. It was also an opportunity for Prime Minister Puna to reinforce the purpose and intention of Maramoana. And following this workshop, the Maramoana Task Force continued to meet to go through the draft Maramoana Bill. Eventually, everything in the bill was agreed except for the inclusion of zones closed to fishing. The Seabed Minerals Authority accepted the closure of up to 50 nautical miles around each island to deep sea mining. Um, but Cabinet requested a presentation from the Secretary of Marine Resources, who was against having areas closed to industrial fishing. And Cabinet also invited myself to represent those arguing for closed areas. At the time, there weren't a lot of scientific studies on the benefits of large scale marine protected areas to biodiversity, but I was able to find some new studies on the benefits of a shark sanctuary and an older one from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park on the benefits of closures to uh, migratory species. Were you able to hear that last bit? Yeah? Okay, great, thanks. I just noticed that my internet connection was unstable. Um, I was also able to find uh, a, a paper uh, by SPC written, and, and a few others, uh, written back in 2016, which talked about um, interaction between artisanal fisheries and subsistence fisheries and offshore fisheries, uh, per se fishing specifically. So it actually talked about the importance of closed areas for um, as a management measure for tuna. So it's um, interesting that that was published back in 2016. And, um, you know, we've sort of had some debate about the importance of um, protected areas for tuna since then. Um, so, yeah, I found studies on the benefits of a shark sanctuary, an older one from the Great Barrier Marine Park on benefits of closures to migratory species. And presented. I presented three options, the 24 nautical mile closure, a 50 nautical mile closure, and a 100 nautical mile closure based on what the various people wanted. Um, the president of the House of Ariki also asked me asked to accompany me to the cabinet meeting and he appealed to the cabinet ministers regarding the importance of area closures to the Cook Islands communities we met around the country. Following those presentations, cabinet decided to close 50 nautical miles around each of our 15 islands to fishing and deep sea mining. Um, and this detail was included in the bill and the bill went through to Parliament and was passed in July 2017 with support from both sides and um, our, our Aronga Mana, our traditional leaders. Next slide. <laughs> so in summary, um, the consultation period was, the heavy part of the consultation period was in uh, from 2011 to 2016, it's five years of consultation, um, 34 public meetings, five workshops, 32 committee, steering committee and task force meetings, um, and led by traditional leaders and supported by government and our local um, environment NGOs. Next. People shaped the proposal. They wanted to include the north. Um, they wanted to make it multiple use and they wanted to have large protected areas around the islands. Next. So I think this is my final slide, but um, just in summary, what the Act does is it establishes Maraimwana over the entire marine space, including lagoons and reefs. Its primary purpose is to protect biodiversity, ecology, and heritage values within the whole exclusive economic zone. Um, it establishes uh, institutional arrangements, uh, a coordination office, and provides for marine spatial planning and zoning throughout the exclusive economic zone, as well as at the island level. It establishes 50 nautical mile protected areas around each of the islands where there will be no large scale commercial fishing or seabed minerals activities, um, and that 16% of our exclusive economic zone, or 324,000 square kilometres. And it requires public annual reporting to monitor and evaluate progress. Is there another slide after that? I'm not sure if there's... 
yeah, that's that's it. So um, <laughs> I hope that I didn't go over time. <laughs> no, that's thanks, really, thanks for listening. Um, thanks for giving us that great insight into um, that was a it was a five year process, wasn't it? For more than five years. Yeah, seven altogether. Yeah, seven altogether. Um, yeah, and it's I know that um, there's plenty of uh, I guess really long fought battles or things that have been going on here for a really long time. I find that seven year um, that is highly commendable and really inspiring. Um, at just a time frame to be able to actually establish that protected area. So amazing work and thank you for for sharing us with the, um, those details Thanks. um we we do have a, a few questions in the q a for those of you that are wondering if it's been recorded it has been recorded and it will be available um online tomorrow in, in the afternoon we'll have it up um i'm going to activate a few things in the resources panel so that you guys will be able to check them out um you'll uh you should see there's um an access to the youtube and the news page, and then some. Um, there's two links in the through the resources tab. You'll be able to go to the UNESCO website where you'll find stuff about um, the links and also um, the navigation paper that we uh, mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, we'll take some questions. I think um, I think the first one. Um, there's the first one that we've got. I think I might just shoot this one to you, Jackie. Uh, well, it is for you, Jackie, but we're gonna start with this one since you presented just recently. Uh, Marina was wondering, um, looking back, do you feel that Mariah Moana has successfully achieved its objectives and principles? Also, how can we access reports or outlook report to evaluate its performance? Thank you for that question. Yeah, unfortunately, um, the uh, progress of Mariah Moana um, slowed down quite heavily um, after the legislation was passed and uh, there was sort of a bit of a change in priorities for the government. Um, the, the institutional arrangements for Marae Moana um, weren't realised as, as they needed to be according to the legislation. Um, so the progress on developing uh, regulations and marine spatial planning um, and developing our annual reports um, slowed down a lot. And I know the, the, there was the pandemic um, in 2020 um, and a couple of years after that. Uh, but, um, you know, I was quite saddened to see after I left um, um, that the progress on Marae Moana had slowed down a lot um, in terms of, you know, developing those regulations and so on. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Leading on from that, just because it's um, also directed to you, uh, the Cook, uh, an anonymous attendee has asked us uh, this one. The Cook Islands recently protested the UMC and held a DS at Deep Sea Mining Symposium. Why would they be doing that if Mariah Moana was doing its job is the question. Well, the truth is that, like I said, Mariah Moana is not performing as it should be. Um, it's not been implemented as it should be. Uh, it's an integrated, you know, many times, and it's been recorded, um, people from both the community and the government wanted um, Mariah Moana to be an overarching policy. Um, to guide development in, in the ocean space. Um, and and it was repeated often by Prime Minister Puna that um, protection was the priority, that it, that it was uh, the primary objective, and that became incorporated in the legislation. Um, so uh, it's, it's not doing its job as it should be. Um, I think that, you know, the public will benefit a lot by going through the marine spatial planning process in terms of learning about different areas that could be important for fisheries or important for cultural heritage or you know those sorts of things and um uh it's it's not actually being implemented as it should be mm. always more work to be done always more um yeah thank you for that jackie um the other questions, I'm going to shoot to James about this one with the High Seas Treaty. I think you're better to, well, 
Um, Marina had another good question about the High Seas Treaty referencing to traditional knowledge in the High Seas. Um, whose traditional knowledge takes precedence? And can you give us an example of a mechanism that uses traditional knowledge in ocean use of the high seas? Yeah, thanks, Ari. And thanks, Marino, for the question. Um, I, I wasn't involved in those negotiations myself, and there might be people listening who were, but my understanding is that um, lots of the, the, the principles around traditional knowledge is, in is enshrined in the the international legislation um, in the Global Ocean Treaty. Um, but the, the negotiations were so fraught that in order to get the treaty over the line, a lot of the detail around how it's going to be implemented was put off until later. And so we don't actually have the detail around how those elements are proposed to be implemented in practice. And so all that's been um, deferred really until the first conference of the parties. So once those 60 countries ratify the treaty, there will be a a COP uh, for the Oceans Treaty, and whichever 60 states have ratified will decide um, a whole lot of stuff about the implementation. So that's a, a great reason um, for as many Pacific countries and like-minded countries to ratify as soon as possible so they can be part of that of that corridor when it happens. Yeah. Excellent, thanks. I'm gonna throw, throw to Dan, so see he's got something to say. Yeah, and just to follow on from that, and, and the reason I shared those links, Marinor, is um, because nothing exists in that space just yet, a lot of the work that's already been done by the UNESCO Local and Indigenous Knowledges team uh, is work that's already in use in the IPBES place, in the BBNJ space. So that's why I shared those links and said it wasn't a direct answer to your question because the answer is we don't have that yet, but we're anticipating that they will look to the processes and the things we've established in those documents um, as processes for how to move forward in that space. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, you can access that one. It, it's it's links in all caps. If you touch, if you click down to the resources tab, that's the one that um, we're referring to. Links in all caps. Um, thank you, Dan and James. Um, if yes, Emery. And I think that's where some quite interesting comparison could be done, looking at the local level examples where traditional knowledge has been incorporated, like mm -hmm. into Taiapuri, Mataitai, Rahui, or temporary closures. Because um, certainly the communities I've worked with across the country, they they will say when they're still within, while it's there established to set up Tino Ranga Tiratanga, it's in this strange Tino Ranga Tiratanga crown relationship. And so or so really is it Tino Ranga Tiratanga, but does it need to exist? It exists irrespective of that relationship. So I think there's some really interesting local examples that can be drawn on to see those differences. And that's um, a super fascinating your corridor as well, Jackie. Um, and has your experience been in Mara? Oh, sorry, Sarah. Are we allowed to ask questions of the other panelists? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. I don't have mine. Sorry, I was, getting a, I was getting a bit of a... Bit, bit excited by that one. This is just when you sort of get into um, nerd alert um, policy land. I just had a question. Um, I I um, just started reading through the act um, online, and is in terms of that traditional knowledge space in Marae Moana, is that do you think captured in the heritage values? Is that where it's tried to come in the in in the actual act or? What sort of some of the tensions that you're seeing um, in there and kind of, you know, as Indigenous Māori to Aotearoa, we're very interested in these ideas of of around Tino Ranga Tiratanga and um, Kaitiakitanga, et cetera. How, how do you grapple with some of the language that's used um, throughout the act? And are some of those things captured in that heritage values or, or, or elsewhere? I think uh, the idea was to capture it in the heritage values, but also by um, trying to include the re leadership of, of our formal bodies of traditional chiefs. So on the council, the Maramoana council, sits the president of the House of Riki, and on the technical advisory group, we have, you know, representative of traditional leaders as well. Um, that's actually imperfect you know like it's not actually 
uh, it's not necessarily true that, um, you know, those people that are in those positions will reflect, uh, you know, uh, the kinds of world views that, that were discussed earlier, that you shared earlier and Dan and James. Um, but uh, we didn't we had didn't have any other way of sort of making sure that we include that perspective. And we don't our, our language around it um, hasn't been, well at least in English, you know, hasn't been that sophisticated like it is like it is in New Zealand, the um, Maori um, definitions and everything. but then yeah, I, I guess that was really how we tried to include it. Uh, I think we, there is a bit in there about making sure we uh, it's going to help us align with different conventions that we've convit, committed to as well. So um, it sort of picks it up there. Mm -hmm. That was a good question. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. I I, th and I see that there's some other open questions. Um, we'll jump to uh, Louisa is is curious that given that the protected area, um, Mora Moana, uh, it, she's, she's asking, is it really the largest protected area in reality? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually um, put the answer in the chat. Um, the largest protected area in the world is the Ross Sea. Um, it's completely closed um, to fishing. So it's the largest area that's completely closed off. Uh, uh, Marae Moana is the largest multiple use marine protected area. It's still a protected area, even though you can use um, you can use it for science, research, for recreation, for economic development. But that use in the Act it says that that use must be consistent with protection and conservation, um, with the primary purpose of the of the Act. So that's how, you know, and that applies to the whole exclusive economic zone. So that's how. Um, it is a it is def defined as a marine protected. It fulfills the definition of marine protected area. Mm. Awesome, thank you for clarifying that. And um, we've got, I think that might have been one of our one of our last questions that was open. I was trying to think of a final, give you guys a chance to, um, if you had a final thought that we wanted to kind of wrap up, uh, like a last thought to. Kind of, I'm trying to tie things together for everyone. I'm, I was thinking of a, a good question for each of you, and I was considering like, what are things that individuals could do to support um, traditional knowledge being incorporated into um, new marine um, marine conservation or marine management um, tools and the ways forward. Anybody feel like, I know it's a big question, but if anyone feels like it, uh, taking that one first, go for it. Go for it, Dan. I'll, I'll do the politician's answer and kind of answer it and not really answer it. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I think I, I think it starts with mindset and it starts with how you see yourself in the world. So my answer is we need to focus everything on about being a good ancestor and then everything else flows on from there. So that's not that's not a practical thing that people can get out there and do. But the more we can talk and the more I've seen these people trying to connect, you know, with you, Jackie, on those things and saying, actually, you know, we are looking, um, you know, we, we feel for you guys in the Cooks because you've got a, a team in at the moment that has, has a certain slant on things. Some other of you folks might be feeling for us here because we've got a certain team in, um, in New Zealand at the moment. And goodness knows what's going to happen in the US coming up. So... Um, just be active. Don't, don't be passive. Be active and be a good ancestor. Thank you, Tim. That's awesome. Yeah, that's similar to my thinking as well. Um, and I would add on to what Dan says. It's really about being open um, too. And that comes from all of our perspectives as well. Um, I think that can come like if I talk about myself as Māori and as an Indigenous person, it's also for us to be open um, as well um, too, and that our, we, our ancestors were not um, static, so our culture is dynamic um, too, and it's ever-evolving. And so, of course, we want to be, we evolve and we adapt um, as well. The tuapapa or the foundation of who we are, that stays there 
you know, like the, our kawa that remains. Every day we know the sun is going to rise and set, and etc. Um, but I think that part of being open is is super important. And similarly to Dan, that applies to all all areas, um, including marine management. Thank you. That was excellent. I I won't I won't put either of you on the spot unless you wanted to say add anything. I think that I that's <laughs> oh, I thought you were gonna make us our No, um, I wasn't going to. <laughs> Um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to talk about what, what Dan and Anne-Marie said. Um, I, I think but for myself, what I was thinking is, is really asking ourselves those questions of, of where we get our relationships with the ocean from. Um, for some of us, those questions may be in our mind all the time. And for others of us, we might not think that. Um, certainly some of our cultures may not think that very often as a regular practice. And um, bringing that forward into our mind thinking what's our relationship with the particular place where we are, where we live, where we work. Um, and then talking about that relationship with other people as well, not just keeping it inside our head, but articulating it and maybe starting to talk about things collectively in a different way. Kia ora. Yeah,